My guest today is working on her life stream. She's got a farm in Westfield, Indiana, and openly, she's here to tell us about life on a farm and how many people would love to live on a farm. It's not really what we're talking about today. What we're practically talking about is how life on a farm improves people's health, life, and well-being by what they can receive from good farming in the communities in which they live. Thank you for joining me today, Kay. I really do appreciate the time that you're giving me to tell us all about your farm. Thanks, Blake. I'm really looking forward to it. Great. Well, listen, let's get started with how did you possibly begin life on a farm there in Westfield? I moved here in 2006 with my husband, who a year later was killed in a car wreck, and I didn't want to move. Uh, Having a farm was my lifelong dream, and I decided to figure out a way to make it work. Okay, and what made you want to go into farming in the first place? Were you some sort of proprietor of some other type of establishment where a farm made sense in terms of a supplemental aspect of that part of your life, or were you just always intrigued was, by farming? It was a childhood dream. I've always had a passion for animals. I've always had animals and uh, and gardening. I like to, you know, I'm a chef, and I like to eat well. I like to know where my food comes from. So I have incorporated all that into the farm. How is it that you made a life on a farm? Did you have to build structures when you got the land? Was it already there on on the premises? Did you have to um, outsource opportunities to local business people or local builders to get the place looking the way you wanted it, envisioned it in your mind, in your dream set? Or practically, did you have to do it all from scratch on your own? Some of the buildings were already here, and some of the fencing was already here. I have installed quite a bit of, bit of fencing, uh, taken down structures, started other structures, built pens. Um, you just find a way to fill what you need at the time. So, you know, basically when I moved here, we had two pastures, and now we're up to, uh, gosh, I don't even know, one, two, three, four, five, six, with more going in. Our big pasture's been divided. So... A lot of it is friends that have helped uh, considerably. I've also hired people to help me, um, but I'm basically a do-it-yourselfer. Now, practically, life on a farm is very different than most people feel who live in in our city dwellers. What is the most important part of living on a farm right now in terms of animal husbandry and how you care for your and tend the flocks that you have in the farm? Well, what's most important is, you know, of course, they need to be fed and watered, kept clean and happy. Uh, I think it's very important for the animals to have a very good life. I like to know where the my produce is coming from, what earth it's grown in. I like to know what's being fed to my pigs, my horses, my chickens, everything. Just to, I like my hands on everything. Sounds like you have quite a lot of animals on the farm for people to come out and see. What types of animals do reside on your homestead there? Well, we breed Baroque Pinto type horses. We also board horses. So we have quite a few out here, up, upwards of 20 at times. The Hamilton County 4 H Llama Club is out here. They have probably close to maybe 100 llamas. We have about 60 chickens that are both raised for meat and free-range eggs. And, of course, we have ducks and one cow. Sounds like a child's uh, afternoon of playtime is really an opportunity there. How many people tend to come out to the farm during a given week in the spring and summer? Usually we set tours by appointment, and it is a working farm. In order for people to be safe and secure, I like to give them a personal one-on-one tour, whether it's a group of people um, or individuals. Many people are looking to live healthier. What products and garden edibles does Wild Feather Farm offer to the public? We offer a variety of fresh herbs, tomatoes, green beans, squash, zucchini, eggplant, peppers. Sounds like lots of vegetables that are really important for the healthy life that most people need to live, live out their days in good health. Lots of kids have no understanding for a traditional farm life. How might a Campfire Girls or Cub Scouts group utilize the farm for a tour to earn a badge? We can do a farm tour, introduce them to the animals, go through the garden, show them how we amend the soil, what it takes to grow the vegetables. Um, They can come out and groom a horse, 
campfire building, house of a pond. There's, there's just there's a lot of outdoor things that they can do. Sounds like a wonderful opportunity for every group to experience, to come to Westfield, to live on a farm for a few hours, and to really experience life on a farm. How wonderful it is that you produce this little farm for people to enjoy in that sort of way. Now, many people like to think about living on a farm, but they don't really realize how much work it takes in order to produce good food in life to keep them healthy for the long term into retirement. How many types of vegetables do you feel it takes for a human being to consume in order that they might live a healthier lifestyle in their own way? Do you feel like the produce from your farm is different from other growers in the way that you tend it so that people really have healthy living in mind when they come out to purchase the products from your farm? Well, from the beginning, you know, my soil has never been having any herbicides, pesticides, or fertilizers. We recycle, spent manure, till that into the garden, um, and that's the way they did it a long time ago. So if you know from your farmer how your vegetables are raised or how your meat is raised, um, you know, the importance for me is knowing where your food comes from, cooking it fresh or canning it for later in the, in the winter um, and staying away from boxed foods, processed foods, um, you know, shop on the outside of your grocery store, not the inside of the, of the rows. And, and, you know, in today's society, we don't have a lot of time to prepare food, but with my chef background, I can teach you quickly how to prepare a fresh meal with some of the meat that I offer and the vegetables I offer. So it sounds like chef demonstrations might be something on the horizon in your farm. What a wonderful opportunity for families to come out at some point in the future to have dinner or to, you know, get a lot of information about healthy lifestyle and healthy eating and healthy cooking from a world-class chef. What a great opportunity for them. In life, many people are looking for how to stay healthier in a way that makes them live longer and last longer in terms of their overall body and cellular health. How is it important is it for vegetables and other aspects of life on a farm to be raised in a proper way in order for people to get the best produce and nutrients from all the aspects of life on a farm? Well, you know, just just knowing what it takes to produce that one vegetable. It's not just planting that plant and watching it grow. These seedlings are started indoors. You are amending the soil throughout the winter. You, you, it's a constant nurture, caring environment on a daily basis. So you have cancer patients that often buy my stuff because they know what's in the ground and I can give them good recipes or even make it for them. A lot of people feel that they should get homegrown foods from local farms for two reasons. One, to help local farmers to keep life on the farm going, but also because producing healthy living is about eating good quality produce. How do we know that your produce is so different than other people's produce in the supermarket or other chain places that people tend to buy their produce? Well, in a supermarket, you don't know where that food's coming from. It can come from Mexico, California, Canada, anywhere. If you come to my farm... You physically see where this plant has been grown and harvested. You know what's going in the soil, how it's cared for, and ultimately, you will taste the quality. That's incredible. Now, openly, I'd like to ask you, how many months does it take to produce one vegetable on a farm? Pick your favorite and tell us a little bit about that vegetable and why you chose it and why you feel that it is good for healthy living for people to consume and to choose every month when they visit your farm? I raise a variety of tomatoes. And tomatoes uh, take a while to start. You start them inside uh, in the winter months. And then when it's warm enough, after you've hardened them off, getting them used to the weather, you plant them in the ground. You constantly are tilling up the soil, checking their health, pruning them if necessary. Um, And then when they get ready to harvest, they're loaded with vitamins and antioxidants and things like that. And there's so many different things you can do with tomatoes, such as salads or sauces, salsa. I mean, tomatoes 
are just a great vegetable to have. How many types of feelings do you have to deal with in terms of animal husbandry? Because I'm pretty sure that animals have feelings too, don't they? I believe that they do. You know, we have approximately 20 horses out here from all ages and breeds. We also breed horses. We have Hungarian pigs that are woolly. Uh, they're called mangalitsas. They are considered a lard pig and that they are marketed to the general public as well as high-end restaurants. In addition to that, we have free-range chickens, both meat chickens and free-range brown eggs, which are very high in omega-3s and omega-6s. The yolks are a dark, rich orange. Um, we also have, for fun, we have a cow named Kitty Cat, which hopefully I will get into producing uh, the grass-fed beef. And, you know, the uh, occasional barn cat. Uh, the Hamilton County 4-H Llama Club also has about 100 llamas out here. Wow. Sounds like quite an afternoon of experience for any large group that wants to come out and live life for a few hours on the farm. Now, you mentioned that high-end restaurants are really interested in some of your woolly pigs. Why is that exactly? What is it about the way that they are raised or the way that they are built or the way that their meat kind of lays within the animal itself that makes that such an important product for the local restaurants to know about that you carry on your farm? Well, the mangalitsa pig is considered a lard pig. Most of the pork that we get in the stores comes out of a meat pig. So typically when you are eating your standard pork, you cut the fat from, say, the pork chop because it's chewy. In a mangalitsa pig, it is a heritage breed. It's like what we used to eat back in the early 1900s. So it does have a very thick lard layer. It's very desirable to make pastries with their lard and use it as a spread on your bread. They are high in omega-3s, omega-6s, oleic acid. It's a very healthy fat and quite amazing when you taste it and it melts in your mouth. So these pigs are pasture-raised. Um, happier pig, let them do what they do naturally, uh, and we selectively breed them to keep, you know, product to keep coming. We so, then take them, you know, when they're ready to be harvested, we take them to a local butcher who then packages that meat for us. So do you actually have freezers on the property where people who visit the farm can walk away with some of your pasture-raised uh, pigs and uh, pork meat? Or how can a restaurateur or a local chef get a hold of the quality, high-quality meat that you are producing there on the farm? Do they call you? Do they schedule a pickup? Can you produce that monthly? How long does it take for a pig to be raised to the point of its slaughter in order to produce really good quality restaurant, high-end restaurant quality um, type of meat? Well, from the time the pigs are born, it takes approximately 9 to 12 months. So it's not a short-term investment. They can call me at any time and either arrange a pickup and hopefully here in the future, I'll even offer delivery. Sounds wonderful. It also sounds like that pork roasts that are going to be starting to happen in late summer and into early fall might also be interested in those pigs. Are they large enough for that type of a cooker, or is it really more of a restaurant-only type of pig? Oh, no. They make a wonderful uh, pig roast. Just uh, wonderful. With all the, the good lard that they carry on their body, you're going to have a super moist uh, pig roast. Now, you talk a lot about lard, and to some people that makes them a little leery of uh, pork, but in truth, what you're really talking about is the type of meat, are you not? Because lard in itself is not actually officially some form of white meat. It's really just what keeps the meat itself in a good tender state. Is that not right? It is. They are prized for their lard. Most high-end chefs are really looking for this. They, these mangalitsas are often known for just such a delectable nutty flavor since they graze on pasture and eat acorns and other nuts. Um, and they're great for charcuterie plates as well as roasting or chops. Their meat is a very dark red, rich meat that is well marbled. The flavor is just unbelievable. So that sounds like any local chef or any mom or dad who's trying to produce 
a really good quality dinner for family and friends during the summer cookout months might really want to get on your um, mailing list in terms of how you produce your pigs, when they're really going to be ready for purchase. And also, it sounds like that restaurants could purchase the entire pig itself or pay you in advance in order to have pigs come from your farm. So what a wonderful little aspect of living that you're putting out there for people to enjoy long term in terms of relationships with your farm. Now, in life, we make uh, life easier for ourselves based on relationships that we have with other people. What types of groups are really good for coming out to the farm to help you to produce more uh, garden vegetables or to just enjoy living on a farm for a few hours? Do you offer groups opportunities to come and produce aspects of life with them or how does that work exactly in terms of what you're planning coming up for the summer and fall months? Will there be some sort of a pig fest or will there be some sort of a Halloween hayride or anything like that heading into fall? Let's help people to sort of put in their minds that they should start to plan visiting your farm on their life schedules now. Well, here in the future, we plan to do some more tastings with some charcuterie plates uh, featuring my pigs. Um, it's, uh, maybe some cooking classes on how to use the produce. It is also great for children to come out, see the babies that are being born, and learn where their food comes from. But mainly, you know, the kids are mostly interested in putting the animals and giving the animals treats and that kind of interaction. So it's really good for all ages. You know, I can teach the adults how the produce is grown, why these eggs are good. And then on the other hand, the kids, they want to pet the animals and feed the animals. Let's talk about your eggs for a few minutes. You mentioned that they were farm-raised, and you started to tell us a little bit more about that earlier. Could you pick up from there and let us hear more about what's going on with your chickens on the farm? Okay, they, there are several different ways you can raise chickens. You can raise them in a closed environment, a semi-closed environment, and a completely open environment. There's pros and cons to all of that. If you are raising them in a completely open environment like what I do, my chickens run all over the farm. They're in the woods. They're in the creek. They're in the pastures. They're in... So I don't supplement my chickens with any grit or oyster shell or vitamins or anything like that. They get everything they need naturally. Um, therefore, when you eat one of these eggs, you're going to have higher vitamin content, healthier. Their yolks are super rich, and they are they taste different. Not bad in a bad way they're just richer they're healthier so and a lot of people that have allergies often can eat my eggs now many people are sort of worried about cholesterol today are farm-raised chickens better for that sort of lie that many people told us long ago that we shouldn't have too many eggs during the week but in truth we really can have more but how are what you raise in terms of chickens different from what they might find at the local grocery supermarket or whatnot well, what you're finding at the grocery is eggs that have been made in a controlled environment. These chickens are in cages, typically, or small cages. They're fed a consistent diet of the same thing day in, day out. They get no exercise. They're there to produce eggs. Even though there's a date on your carton, you have no idea when those eggs were put in the carton. If you come to my farm... You know how old your eggs are. You know how to test your eggs if necessary because most people don't test their eggs that they purchase from the grocery store. They just believe in the date and go from there. So I can show you how to test your eggs, show you what's good, when to use them. There's, you can feed your eggs raw to pets, which is really healthy, as well as eat them for yourself. They're great for baking or just eating them scrambled in an omelet. Now let's talk about that a little bit because a lot of people go through eggs in a couple weeks' time, but practically how long are eggs in general good for? And then how long would pasture-raised eggs be good for because they're not exactly put in the same sort of storage as store-bought eggs. So tell me a little bit about the differences of those sort of aspects of life on the farm. Well, when I pick up eggs, I actually, for the ones I keep for myself, I leave them on the counter. In Europe and other places, they, people don't refrigerate their eggs. They will last just as long sitting on a counter as they will in the refrigerator. 
if you purchase eggs in a store, they are already refrigerated. And that is how we are, have become accustomed to purchasing them. They're washed, they're bleached, whatever. I don't wash my eggs. You know, they have a protective coating on them. They sit fine on your counter. If they've sat on my counter for a long time, I don't know how fresh they are. I give them a water test before I use them. So many people are looking to live healthier. What products and garden edibles does Wild Feather Farm offer to the public? Well, our naturally raised pork out of the mangalitsas, the free-range eggs. In the wintertime, I often make maple syrup from my trees, so that is 100% organic, in addition to the organic vegetables that will be ready mid to late summer. How much time does it take to tend to farm? It can take all day if I let it. So, I mean, there's several people that work here on the farm. Um, it's never ending. It just doesn't ever end. So at some point, you have to take a break and put it on the to-do list for the next day. Many people are looking for neat opportunities to get away or to do something different and unusual during the spring and summer and fall months coming up. What sorts of experiences can families do by visiting your farm there in Westfield, Indiana? There are quite a different variety of experiences. We've had weddings out here. We've had business gatherings, um, picnics, campouts, you know, and all of it involves working around the animals, um, campfires, bonfires, and it is uh, a variety of different types of meetings and functions that you can do out here. So really, practically, you're sort of an event venue in a way that many types of organizations and people groups could utilize to really create positive and healthy living oriented experiences for their families, their friends, their corporations, their companies, and all sorts of organizations for profit and nonprofit in general. What a wonderful opportunity you've produced in the Westfield area. How is it that people can really reach your farm in the Westfield area? Is it off a main route or is it along a trail somewhere? Is it deep in the in the forest of Westfield? Tell me a little bit about the environment where your farm resides right now. My farm back in the uh, 60s and 70s and even 80s was also a side beach club. So I have a two-acre pond, a water slide, a couple other slides, a diving platform. So a lot of longtime residents know the place as Hillside, the beach club, and Buckeye Campground. So it's a beautiful piece of property. It has rolling hills and woods and open metal, meadows and a creek running through it. Um, it's at the southeast corner of highways 31 and 38, just four miles north of Westfield. So it's in a real easily accessed location, southeast corner of Highways 31 and 38. Yeah, it's off. my entrance is off Highway 38. Thanks for listening to these Marketing Minutes. I'm Blake Ensign with Blaze Communications, LLC. And this audio cast is a part of a series recognizing the people in our local community. Thanks for listening, and until next time, have a great day.